are things that I know, but there are things that I do not. Various possible futures are happening simultaneously. I can tell you all of them, but I cannot tell you which one of them will come to pass, because every action causes ripples. Consequences both obvious and unforeseen. This is Off Planet Radio. This is The Eye of the Needle, Episode 4. I'm Randy Moggins, and this is Off Planet Radio. When you go out at night to look at the sky, do you go out to view the darkness? No one I know goes skygazing to see the dark. You go to see the lights in the firmament. This moment in our linear conception called time appears to be so dark, but think. Is it this very darkness that frames the distant glimmers of light? Without the contrast of darkness, we would not be aware of the light energies that do indeed flood our world. In metaphor right now, the dark forces seem to be prevailing, but... What if the universe has given you this moment to learn how to shine? What if this darkness is merely the catalyst for the unveiling of magnificent light bearers? The number two is duality. The darkness does not comprehend the light. In even its own dwindling energies, it mindlessly battles for its own survival. Yet it is of nothing itself. It has no substance, it is shadow and void, it battles in its nothingness against the glimmers of light that are moving to become beacons. These are the lessons we need to learn when facing the dark aspects of duality and contrast in the year 2020, the year of double duality. And so we began this year in January, on January 12th, with a Saturn conjunction, Pluto and Capricorn. When these two powerful karmic repercussion planets aligned in this constellation was over 500 years ago. The Saturn and Pluto phenomenon triggers collective shifts. They last connected in Libra in November 1982. And now the synodic cycle is completed. A new one begins with a brand new theme running through it. Old energy is ending. 38 years of karmic energy is closed and dead and will now be repaid. Those who have been spreading light in the world will be rewarded with a transformational rebirth, while negativity will now disintegrate. This is the greatest karmic reset and repay we will ever witness, according to the astrological projections that many are seeing as a result of the ongoing movement in the skies above us. This uh, once-in-a-lifetime planetary alignment in Capricorn is forcing everything out of alignment to fall apart. Whatever lacks integrity, compassion, pure intent, or morality will face the consequences or simply be eliminated as both Saturn and Pluto's influences bring justice and balance back into our lives. The Saturn and Pluto conjunction is a major catalyst signifying the completion of this 30-year cycle. When the planets last met in Libra, and at the start of an exciting new one. We're going to begin to witness either breakdowns or breakthroughs happening around us. Whatever no longer serves a divine purpose clears out and new systems will take form in their place. But this can be a painful process, so it's recommended to surrender to these purging energies and release whatever or whoever holds us back, lowers our vibration, or that we know is not resonating, sustainable, healthy to be around. If we don't make necessary decisions for ourselves, the universe will surely sweep in and make them for us, and this is when we are forced to learn lessons the harder way, rather than navigating them in our own time and in our own terms. These he heavy energies again came out on the full moon of February 8th, 2020, and I personally began to experience death spells, dreams, and sudden violent illness. As I went through this period from February through March, which involved me becoming extremely ill and having to be hospitalized, I began to deal with my own 
energies around death, something that has been a recurrent theme for a number of years. It's caused me to basically come out the other side of a very deep illness, a very long-term illness, probably going back four years, into a period of, I have to say, joy, exuberance, and a sense of life that I haven't had for a very long time. And in a lot of ways, I see that as the mirroring in my own reality, my own body, of what this world is currently going through. And if you look around right now at the events that are rolling out, as I record this show on March 22nd, another double two, I think we can begin to recognize patterns that are unfolding in us, around us, and above us, because ultimately, all of these star systems, constellations, conjunctions, universes, and galaxies are mirror reflections of the own inter- our own internal processes. We are the universe. We are the source of all of the aspects that are swirling around us. And when we begin to realize that and take responsibility for it, the result can be both great despair and great joy at the same time. And so as we look around us right now and we see the events unfolding, this coronavirus that's allegedly circling the earth in a swath of death, we ask questions about our systems and our interactions with it. What if civilization shifts are designed to take humans to another level? What if institutions are the manifestation of the collective will via the taming of lower, lower powers? That, for example, feudalism was a training ground for self-responsibility under the lords which enabled us to emerge into the industrial era and henceforth into the technological era. With all of the burdens and sorrows that came with each one of these systems, we also became more accountable more conscious and more aware inside of our own spiritual systems. So the exploitation had a a dark mirror side to it in the fact of allowing us to begin to examine how we interact with internal systems, external systems, and the systems of the cosmos themselves. If you look around right now at the external systems, our modern political institutions are here to show us our own inner schisms, of this social collective. Politics was originally an adversarial yet civil pursuit. Anybody that is lived above the age of 50 years knows that while the adversarial side was always there, there was in effect rules of civility, of comportment, of a certain grace that one conducted oneself in the public venue. That is now so polarized that we are dividing our collective into warring factions, hordes. That, idea, that ideology is the new hobgoblin that would attempt to force us back into an era of being Goths and Visigoths. If you look at the political system, we have now seen that public figures are basically sources of hatred, of how the mirror world has turned it around, of how leaders are viewed as basically an embodiment of our own shadow side that we have to reconcile self-hatred and the reflection of that onto an externalized figure. And so, as all of these systems gather this energy, they're also imploding, they're also breaking apart. And it's a, it's a good time to begin to examine your relationship to this mirror image world of politics and civil discourse and how we engage the external shadows of our own psyche. So this show has been, um, let's just say, a very long time in fomenting, in bringing forth the information. Some of the data I'm going to talk about in this show goes back to probably late 2019, early January, including some of the information I want to bring out that relates to the eye of the needle in terms of how we originally set it out. Uh, The concept that we are basically recast into a replay game of a previous reality is not lost on anybody who's looked at the loop functions that are present in the current system. 
of how even the coronavirus in some ways feels like a replay of previous attempts to lock down civilization using fear and death as an, a leverage against the human collective conscious will. This is all part of the war on consciousness that has been waged against us. It has to do with cosmic forces that are outworking, but it goes deeply even into our own body, even into our own genetic structures and DNA. And DNA and Amplified Energies 2020 is a year of duality on steroids. Shadow side up, the subject of DNA will become more apparent when we begin to go through this series. As we presented in the David Griffin book, Revelations Regarding the Akashic Records, this is important. Griffin in that book states that Akasha is an ancient Sanskrit word which means ether, a subtle substance or primary creative principle on which physical matter is based. In a sense, it is a complex energy matrix. The term Akashic Record refers to a form of high-density recording using this type of an energy matrix medium and format. The Akashic Records themselves are essentially a massive, cross-indexed and cataloged database of information being continually updated which has been compiled on all beings taking part in the game. Akasha is also sometimes referred to as a library of information, which is true, and a particular section of these records are also referred to in the Bible as the Book of Life. However, this massive database is more than just historical records of what has occurred in the past. It also apparently contains a detailed record of future events and continually updated modeling programs based on past, present, and future. The modeling program computes deviations in probable futures. And right there is a vital clue to the deception and its true nature. Among the many who utilized a portion of this database were Nostradamus, Manley P. Hall, Edgar Casey, but it actually wasn't Casey. Casey himself was simply used as a dissemination portal. He tempor temporarily submerged into unconscious while his body was used as a mouthpiece piece by other beings talking through it. The information which came out of Casey's mouth while he was in an unconscious trance was actually coming from a group of beings who later identified themselves as Ra. Ra, of course, was the ancient Egyptian sun god sometimes depicted as a man with the head of a hawk. And we will cover him a bit more in upcoming chapters. That's a quote from the David Griffin book, Revelation, a briefing for the peoples of planet Earth, peoples of Earth, I'm sorry, on page 80, which covers what Griffin details in the book as being the Akashic Records. So this is where we will diverge from the Griffin narrative a bit. The Revelation book was written in 2010 before the 2012 event. And while I interviewed Griffin in 2012, even then, I think he was still kind of sifting through the concepts that he had put out in this book. The narrative is, in fact, part of an old energy and a timeline. And we use that, that term, a line, in a 3D sense, despite that we do not hold to linear time. I don't hold to linear time, except as it is arrayed in this construct. In fact, it is actually at least two time shifts or what I call lane changes from our present course, that being the 2012 event. What has changed in the 10 years since the narrative was written is that the quantum of human consciousness has shifted. Past the 2012 event horizon and the great lane change of the 2017 American eclipse, a significant number of souls began to transition into new energy timelines, thus shifting the overall human energetic, albeit for most on the unconscious level. And again, we go into this concept of linearity and the human proclivity to operate in three-dimensional concepts. Time itself really is a construct inside of this present matrix. It is what you would view as probably a process of stacked realities, much like a warehouse stored in certain orders, but not necessarily, necessarily linear 
in the sense of how it occurs within the venue of your perception. So past, present, and future events are folded together. Some are looped. Some occur as a result of mathematical erratic equations that emerge out of the collective consciousness interacting with the time stream. All of these factors go into how we experience time sequences within the conscious reality stream. Humans in this construct operate on both an individual conscious reality and the larger collective consensus or agreed-upon stream of time and events, which we call reality. When the individual consciousness shift reaches a certain level, maybe say even 3%, maybe 5 the collective unconscious level also shifts, though generally in the unconscious of the majority. The actual numbers, percentages, are actually guesstimates. We do see that tipping points in civilizations occur between the 3 to 5% levels historically. So beyond the 2012 window, we begin to see the pressure points of emerging new consciousness. Along with this emergence, of course, comes the great battles between old and new consciousness, old and new energies, old and new timelines, as I posted a while back. These are old energies fighting to survive. No one can lock down your consciousness except you. The eye of the needle is the singular point to the multidimensional vision. This has everything to do with what's occurring right now. Darkness does not comprehend light. It mindlessly wars for its own persistence, even as it is waning. The battle is one outside of time where your eternal self awaits you. Do not be afraid. That was a post that I recently made. Uh, on Facebook and Twitter. If our current reality with its schisms, strange events, and tumultuous energies don't convince you, then ask yourself, is this the world I knew in 2010 to 2011? Inside, I suspect that many of you sense, if not know, that we have undergone a dramatic series of changes which have accelerated rapidly, literally changes that once took decades now shift in months. Consciousness is intrinsically linked to our genetic code, and we're going to explore that more in this series. Suffice to say that DNA is the quantum of human evolution, and since we first began researching genetics, it has become the intense focus of both sides of this battle for human consciousness. Genetic engineering, the CRISPR technology, AI, and quantum computing all point to an explosion or an implosion in the quest to control the genetics of the entire world population. Concurrently, the concept of the Akash, the old energy system of the linear cross-index probable futures Akashic records, also known as Project Looking Glass linear replay system, is really actually no longer valid. The database was corrupted when some of us, the new kids, were injected into Looking Glass and in turn unleashed the virus code that brought it down. The contamination was the activated quanta of new energy, new intelligence that came in with the post-World War II children. The new code is the source code. Our DNA contains within it the actual Akashic record sets, not the formula of the probable future software, which was, and is, and is no more, an externalized false version that was programmed into consciousness prior to the game replay. And for that, you can see pages 8 to 83, uh, 82 to 83 in the Revelation book. That book is posted online as a PDF for our subscribers. So you can go look that up via implants into the etheric bodies. Let me say that again. Our DNA contains within us the Akashic record sets, not the formula of the Probable Futures database. They were placed there as etheric implants into our bodies. But the truth is, the true records are within you, resident in latency in a genetic code as what has been called junk DNA. This is why spirituality 
was also externalized into religions, cults, rituals, and occult symbolic systems. To overshadow your own inner source code through priesthoods, grimoires, manuscripts, and talisman, the externalized systems access the base levels of the codes on the physical and astral planes while guiding the masses via kingdoms, tribal traditions, economics, which is symbol alchemy, and governments through externalized authorities, endless wars, religious, tribal, racial, and sexual divisions. The controllers wanted only to keep us all in need, in constant survival mode, and dependent on the external systems of instinct and split consciousness. Now, this split consciousness is something I talked about in the uh, 12 21, 19 show, of how human beings have been systematically split via uh, philosophy, science, mathematics, and what is called rational thinking. Uh, Plato's cave metaphor shows the chalk lines of this in humanity's split consciousness, basically a form of subconscious shadow puppet theater. Plato began by having Socrates ask Glauson to imagine a cave where people have been imprisoned from childhood. Imprisoned from childhood, but not from birth. Important distinction. These prisoners were chained so that their legs and necks are fixed, forcing them to gaze at the wall in front of them and not to look around at the cave wall. Let's just stop there for a minute. Think about your education. Think about the fact that as a child, you were placed first in front of a television set that held your attention, your frontal eye view, kept your head forward looking at information that was being fed to you. Then you were taken and placed into a classroom for 12, 13, maybe even 16 or more years, and forced to not look at anything except what was placed in front of you by teachers, professors, and those who were responsible for basically programming your conscious mind. So in the Plato's cave scenario, these people never look at each other or themselves. Behind the prisoner is a fire, and between the fire and the prisoners is a raised walkway with a low wall behind which people walk carrying objects or puppets. This is literally shadow puppet theater here. Puppets of men and other living things. The people walk behind the wall so their bodies do not cast shadows for the prisoners to see, but the objects they carry do, just as a puppet showman have screens in front of them in which they work their puppets, called a scrim. The prisoners can't see any of what is happening around them. They are only able to see the shadows cast upon the cave wall in front of them. The sounds of the people... Talking the, taking the echo off of the wall. And the prisoners believe these sounds come from the shadows themselves. Socrates suggests that the shadows are reality for the prisoners because they have not seen anything else. They do not realize what they see are shadows of objects in front of a fire, much less that these objects are inspired by real-world things outside the cave which they do not see. Does this not sound like the reality stream you live in? The projections of a world around you that come from the external side rather than the interior of your own consciousness and understanding. Fundamentally, placed in front of a viewing wall, fed imagery, seeing the shadow puppets, seeing the forms move, and never really comprehending what sits behind the dark screens of the consciousness reality that you've been fed as a human being in this in this present experience. And so this this was and still is to a great degree the split consciousness represented by Plato. The cave of the external, limited perceptual consciousness and the shadows of the external causative unconscious. The schism of the unified awareness by captivity and entrainment, or what we call entertainment. Interesting how those two words, words kind of entwine each other. It's the localization of the fixed five. Yeah, who told you you have five senses? Could you have more? 
five senses localized in the head, the mind, the head, and the mind separated from the body, and the separation of conscious perception from both the body and the internal system code of the deactivated source code, also known as DNA sequences. This division of the human consciousness continues through our so-called linear history with the 17th century philosopher Descartes and the mind-body split, also called ex nihilo, nihil fi, meaning nothing comes from nothing, and the so-called mind-body problem, with a debate concerning the relationship between thought and consciousness and the human mind and the brain as part of a compartmentalized consciousness, leading to the mind control programs begun by the Nazis in World War II and transferred into Western intelligence services via Operation Paperclip. In the midst of this, you have Freud in the 20th century, who further split the human consciousness via the trisection of the ego, id, and superego as compartmentalized consciousness. As we've detailed on this show for a decade, MKUltra was the testbed for the wider use of mind control on the general populace. In summary, the majority of so-called civilized world is fractured via the endless slice-and-dice operations of academia, science, and religion. A separation from our innate Akash records, also known as the source code, which actually is inside of us and inside of our genetic coding, our DNA. So I, I need to note here, because I'm not an astrologer, that Astrology, numerology, divination systems of symbolic and archetypal interpretations are useful to the degree that they align with our inner Akashic source code. These systems can be useful tools for reactivation and realignment of the DNA, yet they are all ultimately limited to the construct systems and may falsely revert to the default probable futures data set. Let's, let's dissect that a little bit. Your conscious mind utilizes and streams the archetypes that have been fed into it. You know, the old adage in computer programming about garbage in, garbage out. So a lot of the way that we construct interpretive aspects of all of these systems is through what was previously known about them. So when we look at astrology, when we look at numerology or tarot or any of these other systems, we need to come at it from a clean slate. We need to begin to integrate into our own internal imagery systems. We need to begin to activate that within our own internal processes, the harmonics of our body, which then begin to activate the higher aspects of DNA. So I realize there's a lot of material to cover. We, we sort of are doing a very fast glide through what is basically an introduction to this present state we're in. Um, in this introdu introductory segment, we just note the importance of certain number codes that are detailed in ancient texts, sacred geometry, structures of crystals, musical scales, scientific phenomena, which are nature's clues to unlocking the genetic source codes. And as we go through the series, we'll give this more examination in future episodes. But I want to note the following in this segment one, because this segment one will likely go out to the public. Um, on December 11th, 2019, I posted the following. December 11th, 2019, gateway, hashtag, I the needle 2020. 2019 equals 9 plus 2 plus 1 equals 12. 12 times 12 equals 144. The number 12 carries religious, mythological, and magical symbolism, generally representing perfection, entirety, or cosmic order in tradition since tranquility. 144 is the 12th Fibonacci number, and the largest one to also be a square, as the square of 12, which is also its index in the Fibonacci sequence. 
There are 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, 12 months, 12,000 people sealed from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, making a total of 144,000, which is the square of 12 multiplied by 1,000. The measurement in cubits of the wall of New Jerusalem shown by the angel in Revelation 21, 17. These are all mystical, symbolic, highly encoded archetypes that are embedded into our consciousness as a means to understand something very fundamental about ourselves. What these ancient texts are talking about, I have almost inescapably concluded, has to do with genetic structure and DNA and how it relates to the currently emerging higher consciousness that the darkness is fighting against in what I'm calling the emergence of the dark Aquarian era. And that's going to be segment two. We're going to go into that. We're going to talk about why the world you live in now is not the same as the one you once inhabited. We'll do that on the second part of this for the patrons. For those of you who are getting this on the public side, you can join us at patreon.com forward slash off planet media. The truth really is inside you. The epigenetics, they have done so much of research on this field, on this epigenome. Epigenome is a protein particle responsible for your genes and all the happenings based on genes. Please understand, we are always taught Genes are responsible for our diseases. No, it's not true. Even your DNA is not responsible. The quality of your consciousness is responsible. The quality of consciousness can directly change DNA. Asan Church very beautifully proves even the persistent diseases handed over to you by the previous generations like cancer, sugar, blood pressure, heart diseases, even they can be just altered, changed, transformed by the quality of your consciousness. Another research proves only 35% of Your DNA is responsible only 35% for what you are, who you are, how you are and all the major factors like your longevity, disease, health and everything. Only 35%. The science of epigenetics and the epigenome opens a new door to the great truths declared by Padanjali and Swatmarama. Padanjali in Raja Yoga Sutras and Swatmarama in Hatha Yoga Sutras. Shiva Sutras says very clearly, the man who is in perfect health just by his Nisangalpa means the intentionless consciousness. storm is coming, and when it is over, I fear there will be little left of our world. You read your books about UFOs and Roswell, whacked out theories and government conspiracies. I think that you want to believe. What makes you trust them? I don't know. I'm a good judge of character. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com.